Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our evening service. We'll start with a hymn, hymn number 454. Hymn number 454, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus. And you can remain seated. singing well we will continue with a word of prayer right now father we thank you for the lord jesus and for sending him uh, to earth to die for our sins and god i thank you for the the peace that we have uh, with god uh, through the uh, the lord jesus and god we ask that you you bless the service tonight with your presence and as you speak uh, through our brother and speak through your word that you would speak specifically to our hearts uh, on whatever it is, whether it be service or um, whether it conviction or uh, whatever is on your heart to, to tell us, Lord. We give our hearts and our minds and our ears are open to you now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. But let's take the word of God tonight um, for the last part of this service. And let's turn to the book of Luke. Let's turn to the book of Luke. We're going to look at Luke chapter number 4. Luke chapter number 4. You have your Bibles with you, your Bible in the pew, Bible on your phone. Um, Luke chapter number 4, and verse, we're going to start in verse number 16. And there's just something I wanted to bring up from this passage that I um, that God called my attention to, and uh, it's very pertinent, I believe, to us, um, to Christians all over the world, but especially um, to us here uh, on a Wednesday night. And I've entitled the message uh, for those of you who are taking notes: "Faithful versus Faithful." Faithful versus Faithful. Okay. And I'm not saying the two, same two words twice. There's a difference. Um, it's very interesting, uh, and we're going to see in this passage that Jesus came into contact with people that were faithful, but they were not faithful. And their faithlessness um, had very drastic consequences for them, as it does for us 
even today. So let's look at um, um, Luke chapter number 4, and let's start reading in verse number 16, and um, then we'll continue uh, reading um, later on. And so uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, he says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So I want to I call your attention here to uh, that little phrase there in the middle of verse 16, as his custom was, as his custom was there in verse number 16. Uh, faithfulness is expected and faithfulness is important. And Jesus, well, as a faithful Jew, he was in uh, the, te- the synagogue uh, every Sabbath day. And I think you know the Jews had this custom of being in the Sabbath every, sa- every Saturday, every Sabbath, um, to worship, to praise God, to sing, um, to read scripture. Uh, that was their custom. And uh, their custom uh, was imitated all throughout the Roman Empire. There were synagogues all ag- across the Roman Empire. And that was their custom. That was their tradition. That was their, um, they were faithful in those uh, exercises of the, Jude- the, the religion of the Jews. And that is to be admired. That is very much to be admired. That is to be imitated by us who live in the New Testament, who are Christians today. Um, We need to have these same disciplines, okay? The Jews were faithful in um, prayer. I think we studied that in the synagogue. synagogue, They had times of prayer, and the Jews were very faithful in that. And every Christian uh, today should have that time of prayer where he sets, sets aside everything else, and just seeks God and brings his requests, his needs, his petitions, his thanksgiving, his praise before God. Every Christian ought to have that and ought to be, that ought to be a consistent part of his life, okay? Um, faithful in prayer, faithful in scripture reading. Every Christian should have a Bible of, that he owns and that he takes home every, um, every Sunday and throughout the rest of the week. Opens the word of God and studies what God has to say and listens to the Holy Spirit speaking through the Word of God. Every Christian should be faithful in their Bible reading, faithful in family devotions. I hope those of you who have family at the home take time together to study the Word of God and to pray and to praise God together. A Christian ought to be faithful in those disciplines, faithful in soul winning. A Christian ought to be a soul winner and be faithful at that. A Christian ought to be Faithful in church attendance. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves as the manner of some is. A Christian ought to be faithful in the, what we call these Christian disciplines. Just as the Jews were. Just as Jesus were, was. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2 it says, Moreover is inquire, required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithfulness is foundational. That's my first point. Faithfulness is foundational. But it's not everything, as we're going to see. It's not everything. Because if you look in verse, uh, verses 17 and, 18, uh, 17 and onwards, it, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your years. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying that God has shown up in your midst. I'm here. I am the promised Messiah that you've been waiting for, that the scriptures predicted. I'm the, prom- I'm the one that is going to, you know, he- preach the gospel to the poor, set- heal the brokenhearted. Okay? I'm here to deliver you. I'm here to bring deliverance and salvation. God's about to intervene in your lives. And he gave them a message of hope, a message of expectation. And look at what happened in verse number 22. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? What was their reaction? What was their reaction when Jesus showed up and told them, God's about to do great things. God's ready to help intervene in your life. What was their reaction? Was it a reaction of faith? Was it a reaction of expectation? You know, faith, 
One of the definitions of faith that God has been teaching me recently that faith is expecting God's intervention. Faith is expecting God's intervention. And Jesus shows up and says, God's about to intervene. God's about to do great things. God's about to do miracles. And the people were lacking in faith. They were faithful. These are men that went to the synagogue every Saturday. And yet they were faithless. And their faithlessness is manifested in that little question that they asked there at the end of verse 22. Is not this Joseph's son? Snide remarks. We've got to watch out for snide remarks. Because snide remarks are, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaks, right? And snide remarks, especially about the things of God, and especially about the word of God and God's promises, snide remarks can be evidence of unbelief in our heart. And we've got to watch out for that. We've got to be careful about that. Right? Snide remarks. And then he said, very interestingly, Jesus predicted that more snide remarks would follow. In verse number 23, and... Um, Verse 23, it says, And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Sarcasm. Snide remarks. Whatever, whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And they said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. Okay? It's like, more is coming. Because he could see, Jesus knew that they were full of, he could see their unbelief in their hearts. And they only made one snide remark, but Jesus could tell. These are men who are faithful, but they are not faithful. Okay? And he says, no prophet is accepted in his own country and continues to rebuke them for their unbelief. And what happened because of their unbelief? This is the shocker. And, they, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them in the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine for his word with his power. And it's very interesting that these men who are faithful, these women who are faithful, these teenagers, these young people that were faithful in their disciplines, they wanted to stone and kill the preacher. They wanted to kill the preacher because of unbelief. Now that might be, seem shocking to us. Like, wow, is unbelief really that bad? You think about it in your own Christian life. The times that you were away from God, the times that you, you know, were living in sin, the times that what you failed to, dis to obey, the promptings of the Holy Spirit, that still small voice inside of us. Why? Why did you do that? I want to submit to you tonight that it's because of unbelief. Just like faith is the root, is the foundation for pleasing God, without faith it is impossible to please him, right? Hebrews 11. Unbelief is the foundation of sin. All sin. Okay? Why do young people go off into the world and marry either carnal Christians or unbelievers. Why do Christian young people do that? Because they really don't believe that God is, is, going, is going to provide the right spouse for them at the right time in his own way, a godly spouse. They don't believe that. They'd rather do it their own way. Okay? And you, I could go down the list. I could go down the Ten Commandments and point out how each commandment, each breaking of the commandment is a result of some form of unbelief. And so unbelief is a serious thing. Now it's fascinating to me, you turn over to Mark chapter number 6. It's fascinating to me how merciful and how gracious Jesus is. Because this, even though they tried to kill him, they tried to take him off the cliff and push him off and finish him, but Jesus is merciful. Jesus is gracious. Jesus is loving. Jesus is long-suffering. He's patient. And he gives them a second chance. Gives them a second chance. In Mark chapter 6 and verses 1 through 6, 
It says, and he went out from thence and came into his own country, that's Nazareth again, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, For whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? You see that? It's not just one sarcastic or snide remark. It's several. Several questions. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And get the picture here. These are probably very, very likely the same people that we see in Luke chapter number 4. Same people going through the same customs, going faithful to the synagogue, faithful in the reading of the word, faithful in prayer. And yet what does it say? It says that they, you know, they were offended in him. Same people. Their unbelief hadn't changed. They hadn't dealt with their unbelief. And you see the snide remarks now that are coming out of, that's coming out of their hearts. Their questions are even more. The first, first time there's just one question. And now there's multiple questions coming out of their heart. Because that unbelief has sprouted. And that unbelief has blossomed. And that unbelief is bearing more and more and more fruit. And that's what happens when you don't nip unbelief in the butt. It affects you more and more and more. And Jesus said unto them, in verse number four, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. Same response that you saw in Luke chapter four. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. Okay? It's so fascinating that they were faithful, but they were not faithful. And may the Lord help us not to get into that condition of being faithful. You all are here on a Wednesday night, and that's good. But how's your faith tonight? How's your faith tonight here on a Wednesday night? When you pray, do you expect answers? Do you expect God to answer your prayers? Do you expect God's intervention in your prayer life? Both privately and corporately? Or do you just pray because that's what we normally do? When you read the Bible in the morning, or at night, whenever you do, or when you have family devotions, you're faithful in that. Are you expecting God to speak to you? Are you expecting God to show you truths that you've never seen before? That's what God does. That's God's intervention in your life. You, you are wondering, what's God going to do with my life? Are you expecting God to show you as you study his word? Or do you just read your Bible because your parents make you or because that's what we normally, that's what good Christians do? We have to just get out of that root, the routine. We have to get out of that rut of just going through the motions. And we have to expect God to intervene. When you go out soul winning, when you pass out tracts, when you witness to your neighbor or to your coworkers or to your schoolmates, do you expect God's Holy Spirit to convict them? Are you expecting that? Are you expecting that they'll get saved one day? Or you just give out tracts because, you know, Pastor Boyer's been preaching about soul winning and, you know, I should probably grab some tracts from the track rack, ease my conscience. How's your expectation? How's your faith? Are you full of faith? Are you full of expectation of God's intervention? Okay. I need to ask myself that too. As a missionary, am I full of expectation as I travel on deputation, as I go to the, to the mission field? Am I expecting God to transform cities, to transform people's lives? Am I full of expectation? Are you full of expectation for your missionaries when you pray for them? That they'll have an impact, an eternal impact on the people that they're reaching out to, people that you'll probably never meet? Are you full of expectation? Okay. Unbelief says none of these things will happen. Unbelief says, you know, we're just going to go through the motions because we've always gone through the motions. And God's, we really can't expect God to do anything. That's tragic. 
because God's ready to intervene. God's ready to intervene in your personal lives. God's ready to intervene in the corporate, the group body of this church. God's ready to intervene. But unbelief does not agree with God. Unbelief does not take God at his word. Unbelief limits the Holy One of Israel from doing mighty works. And it's so interesting to me, there in verse number six, he marveled because of their unbelief. Faithlessness is fascinating. Faithlessness is fascinating. He's just like, wow. I've done this for other people. I've done this for people in Capernaum. I've done this for people down at Jerusalem. I want to do mighty works here, but they just won't believe me. And their unbelief limited God. Their unbelief limited God. One of the most tragic works is that he could there, he could there do no mighty works because of their unbelief. He laid his hands on a few sick folk, a few people, a few people in that congregation, a few people in that town were bold enough and confident enough and daring enough to take Jesus at his word and believe him. And he intervened in their life. A few people, but the majority, the majority shut him down. And because of that, we don't read of Jesus coming back to Nazareth ever again. We need to be full of faith. Our unbelief, our unbelief is, um, it's contagious. Our unbelief is contagious. But faith also is contagious as well. You see someone, maybe someone in a youth group, maybe someone here in the, in, in the adult Sunday school class or the main service, you see someone who's full of faith, believing God, they give testimony to what God's doing in their life, how God's intervening, he's meeting with them in the morning, they're passing out tracts and people are coming to church and getting saved, that's contagious. That's contagious. And if you want to see revival in your church, you want to see revival in your nation, Start expecting God's intervention. Start expecting God's intervention in your own life. Christianity always starts in your own home, your own personal life. It's a religion of the heart, first and foremost. When you start expecting God to intervene in your own personal life, God starts showing up, it catches and it spreads. So how's our faith tonight? How's our faith tonight? Mostly a message on the negative aspect of unbelief. There's three verses that I'm going to give you and I will close. Three verses I want to give you on how to build your faith. Very simple principles from the word of God. I don't have time to expound on all of them, but there's three verses that I see that are key to building your faith if you're struggling with unbelief tonight. The first one is Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. Romans 10 and verse number 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Why do we have the word of God? Why do we have this Bible? You know that almost half of this Bible is narratives, stories, about ordinary people like you and me. Common folk who went through, you know, who went through the same things, the same struggles that we go through, experience the same disappointments in life, But God intervened. And the more you study the word of God, the more you study those stories of how God intervened in these common, ordinary people's lives, the more your faith will grow. Because you'll realize that God, who did that for them, is no respecter of persons. And what God did for them, he's still willing to do for me. Our God doesn't change. Our God is no respecter of persons. He still wants to intervene miraculously in your lives and in this church and in this country and in this world. Study the word of God. Study what God did in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the book of Acts especially. And let your faith grow. Secondly, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2. Wherefore, seeing also we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, must lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race 
that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Spend time with Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. I hope you have meaningful time with Jesus every day. Not just praying and giving your requests to him, although that's very important, but fellowshipping with him. Jesus said, abide in me, and I in you. How much time have you spent with Jesus this week? As you spend time with Jesus, he is the author, he is the source, and he is the completer. He's the finisher of our faith. And the more time you spend with Jesus, the more your faith will grow and the more expectation you'll have. Finally, Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. We are also witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, which God gives to them that, uh, that obey him. It says, the scripture says very clearly that God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is faith. If you read Galatians chapter number 5. Obey him. When God prompts you, step out by faith. When God tells you something in his word, do it. Little areas, big areas. When God tells you to do something, just obey. And as you obey, your faith will grow. As you walk in obedience, your faith will increase. Okay? Those are just three principles. I don't have time to dwell on them. Increase your faith. Believe God. Expect God's uh, intervention today. Expect God's intervention in this church. Expect God's intervention in your life. There's nothing like living a life filled with God intervening day after day after day. There's nothing like that. And that life can be yours. You can experience a miraculous life every single day. God intervening every single day. In little areas, in big areas, in your family, in your, in your own personal life, victory over sin that you never imagined could, you could have. It's the life that Jesus died and rose again for you to have. And it's only possible by faith, by expectation. Let's be faithful. Let's be faithful in our Christian discipline. But let's be faithful, full of faith. And let's change this world, this town, for Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Bow our heads and talk to him. I don't know how God's worked on your heart. Maybe there's someone here. I trust that you're all saved, that you're on your way to heaven. And maybe you're here and you're not yet saved. You've never put your faith in Jesus Christ and you don't expect him to give you eternal life. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you could place your faith in Jesus Christ. And by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, you can expect that he will forgive your sins and give you eternal life. But for those of you who are saved, and I trust that's the majority of you, examine your hearts. Is there unbelief in your life? Do you just find yourself going through the motions? Do you find yourself praying, reading your Bible without really expecting God to do anything? Do you find yourself passing out tracts or just coming to church without really expecting God's intervention? I don't know how the Spirit may have applied this message to your heart tonight, but you say, God has spoken to me about an area of unbelief in my life. And I want to confess that and get that right with God. You know, there's a man in the Bible who said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And Jesus answered that prayer by intervening in his life. And maybe that's a prayer you need to pray to tonight. Maybe there's someone here who would say, there's unbelief in my heart. I've not been expecting God's intervention, but I want to get on the ground of faith. And I want to believe God. Anyone here at all, just raise your hand. I'll pray for you. Yes, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see several hands. Put them down. Amen. I see the hand. Anyone else? God's touched your heart? Yes, I see that hand. God's touched your heart. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? Yes, more. 
Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. God wants to intervene in your life. He's just waiting for you to believe him. He's waiting for you to expect him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. I pray that you'd help these people to get on the ground of faith, to expect your intervention. Lord, you want to do great things with this church. You want to save people in this community through this church. You want to bring revival to this city, to this country. You want to meet with people in the morning. You want to speak to them. You want to give them direction in their life. You want to give them comfort through the difficulties that they're going through. You want to answer their prayers. Lord, help them to believe that and help them to expect that and to get on the ground of faith, to follow these few principles that we've looked at tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd banish unbelief from our heart. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Jesus' name.